I hold in my hand a phone book. If you're if you're really old, you may have you may have had one of these in your home. <laughs> ah, the thing is going on and off and on and off. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have one minute to ten, so I'm going to get the other screen started. All right, so. We are ready, kids. We are ready. At least I think we are. We're ready for the Ides of March. The Ides of March uh, was made famous by Shakespeare when he wrote a play a while ago um, about the life of Julius Caesar, who was an emperor, who uh, chose not to listen to the warning um, of his daily advisor when he said, how does it look? And the advisor said, nah, not good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the heiress. And, um, and he said, well, you know, I got stuff to do. I got people I'm meeting. We're going to have coffee. And he went and got stabbed by everybody who, um, had given up trying to vote. He wasn't listening. And so they said, all right, here, hold this. And, uh, history moved on. So, Typically, the middle of a month, I've noticed, tends to have a bit of a, an, <laughs> the middle of a month tends to have some up and down moments. <laughs> There's a reason why I decided not to become a serious speaker. <laughs> Stuff like that happens. So the middle of the month, I don't know, um, there's stuff, you know, it, 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 our, our, our days ebb and flow, and quite often uh, when we come to the Ides, the middle, um, we should maybe be looking over our shoulders, or at least peeking through the doorway before we stride off into history. Um, the reason I'm holding this, to, I couldn't believe I got this, this is a, an, a, a modern day. This is a telephone directory huh, of businesses that just came in the mail, like last week. And I said to myself, well, here's a thing <laughs> that I'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> ah, everything old is new again. Um, <laughs> speaking of everything old is new again, this year, uh, somebody pointed out to me, it's, it's really quite amazing. This year is the 40th anniversary of my first involvement with You Can't Do That on Television and the original Care Bears. Uh, in 1982, uh, I joined the cast of You Can't Do That on Television. And uh, same day as Alice. basically been the, the grown-up lady on the show, and, uh, and I had never had any kind of recognition at, like hers. So it was a lot to, um, to think about and to figure out how to be there, but, but shift the perspective, pivot the character a little bit, uh, change the trajectory, and... Uh, Oh, look, people. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Charles. <laughs> Who else do I have here? All right, where is it here? Good morning, you're here. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You can't believe it's four years? Imagine how I feel about it. So I posted, I posted it yesterday. <laughs> and one of, one of our really great fans said, yeah, I was only three, but I remember it. Okay, here's the thing about that. <laughs> I, of course, was a child star who they made up to look like a grown person. <laughs> you, you have a beard. You can't tell me you were three. All right? That's just, 
that's the, I'm here too, it's like romper room. Morning, Anne. <laughs> the first time I saw You Can't Do That, I was hooked on it, says Charles. Well, thank you, Charles. You're a man of great distinction and discernment. Uh, it's for like romper room. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I find it very disconcerting that men with beards, especially with weird beards that have gray in them, saying, yes, I watched you when I was a child. It's off. You did not. You were 37. <laughs> and when I say things like that, um, I tend to get rather surprised <laughs> reactions. But they're not thinking of me as somebody who hadn't really intended to look like a mom or like that mom. I'd kind of thought of myself as, you know, the eternal ingenue. <laughs> but no. And then the Care Bears. Oh, the Care Bears. So uh, this kind of is the right direction for what I want to talk about today. The Care Bears concept was that they live in the land of Carolot, and they had all these amazing personalities, and they were little, um, you know, um, I guess disciples of caring and sharing and having fun and doing stuff, and they had superpowers, and they were very small. <laughs> They were little bears. <laughs> and um, I, I had so much fun because they, they gave us full reign. They hadn't invented beyond the basic idea who the bears were like, what they, what they could be expected to do. And so uh, we got to create their essence. And you know what's really interesting? Um, I just discovered yesterday when I was looking it up, You'll never guess. Uh, so I, I voiced three of the original bears. Um, Friend Bear, who was a clumsy superhero. I'll save you. Ow. Uh, and Love a Lot Bear. I'm Love a Lot Bear. And uh, Wish Bear. I wish things could be better. So you know what I discovered? I discovered that Georgia Engel went on to voice Love a, Lair, the Love a Lot Bear when the series left Ottawa and, and went to Toronto. And so the, the movies and the specials that, that were done after that, Georgia had, had taken over uh, one of my voices, which is wonderful because when you think of Georgia in um, uh, Mary Tyler Moore, she has the perfect voice for Love A Lot Bear. And so I'm really flattered. It was so amazing to see that. So <clears throat> the thing about channeling all those different creatures was not the biggest thing. The biggest thing was that we were breaking with the traditions of television with You Can't Do That and The Care Bears and then later on with Teddy Ruxpin. Um, and Teddy was, uh, Teddy's a little younger. We're going to have to wait a couple of years for it to be Teddy's 40th anniversary, but we're all excited about that. Um, the whole idea with the, our programming if I can take ownership, is that <clears throat> we were talking to the kids. We weren't preaching at the kids. We weren't cramming lessons spoken in a more mature voice um, when, when we were um, doing our shows. Steve, <laughs> you were 17 when you watched your candidate on television. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> Charles, you were 12. That's more like it. I love you guys. You're just amazing. Um, so, breaking with tradition. I'm just, I'm just liking their comments because that's what this whole thing is about, right? So, <clears throat> breaking with tradition is scary. Uh, especially in in film and television, because film and television has a lot of money riding on it, and you don't want to you don't want to mess with a thing that works. So it takes somebody fairly farsighted and brave to say, yeah, yeah, that worked, but I think this will work even better, because times are changing, and then doing it, it's it's unusual to see. I mean, sometimes you sit back and you think, is everything a doctor show or a cop show or a murder show? I mean, is everything about six adults hanging out 
is everything about uh, the same family dramas? Is it always that? Are we not doing anything new? And the answer is, um, it's it, it's hard to say. Let's give it a try. And it's interesting when you look at some television, you say, oh, well, this is like this, and that's like that, and that's like the other. You can see, um, I've got a weird thing going on here. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how the echoes, you can see the ripple effect 10 years later and 15 years later. What's really interesting is there has been no one who has figured out the trick, who has figured out the mm, recipe that Roger Price brought to You Can't Do That on Television. And we talk about it a lot amongst ourselves, that it was a really interesting combination of brilliant writing, brilliant concept, brilliant structure, uh, genius coaching, and, and pretty cool actors, pretty, pretty adventurous, pretty brave, pretty dedicated, uh, talented actors. Not, not one of those things alone was responsible for it. You know, we did a 30-second sketch concept. We were doing essentially <laughs> flash fiction, take it off the page before it was a thing. 30 seconds is a, is a short period of time to get a full uh, beginning, middle, and end done well. And, and Roger has a gift. He really has a unique gift in summing up everything. There's nothing left to say. And it's not overwritten. And so that became our signature. Slime, of course, became our ultimate uh, penalty and, and, and water because we needed to have a way that the kids didn't get away with everything. And so we had these things and we didn't know where they came from. No one's done that uniquely again. No one has come up with good dialogue, really smart satire focused on a young audience, a thinking audience. No one's doing it yet. They're, they're trying to either copy what we did or age them up and make them sophisticated. And that's fine, but there's a lot of time to be aged up and sophisticated. I have a few years to share. And, and so it's, it's a real honor to be recognized. Um, oh, listen to this. Jeff, Jeff Wise, you're very wise. You're very wise. I always felt like You Can't Do That was British comedy meets laughing. You know what? That's exactly right. Uh, with a little side order of Canada thrown in. Side uh, it, it's right. It, he's absolutely right. It had that British sensibility, and it had the crispness of laughing. And then the thirty-second sketch kept it fast-paced. You never, you never got stuck anywhere too long. And that's important in comedy. You don't want to overplay it. And so that tradition of breaking with tradition was essentially how I broke into show business. Every single thing I did without realizing it, I was breaking with tradition. The, the show that I first did, I produced in a, a very elegant um, private, private members club that had never had live stage shows. I was the first. Uh, people came to see the show, not so much because I was doing a show, but they'd never seen a show there. And so, so I was very lucky that way. Um, <laughs> You can't do that with Saturday Night Live for kids. That's right. <laughs> Live from Ottawa, <laughs> ish. Um, so the 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 shift that I made was to deliberately not look like everybody else. The shift I always made was to make it difficult to define me. Now that that of course became difficult for my long-suffering agents who said I can't we can't pigeonhole you and and I said well it sucks to be you but that's where you're getting your 18 percent so soldier on the the idea that you can be different you can change things up means that it doesn't get 
stale and your ideas evolve and grow and you bring in newer audiences. When I was when I was talking to a friend of mine who said, how are you going to pitch all these wonderful things, your pivotry and your story me TV, who's your audience? And I said, well, aside from anyone who uh, watched Teddy Ruxpin, Care Bears, and you get it on television, which meant that in the 80s you were either five or 17. <laughs> How old are you now? Uh, that's a pretty wide market. And we were syndicated in 53 countries, which meant that we had a footprint everywhere. And then, military job. Every brat that ever was. Every brat who is. Every brat coming in to the world is potentially my audience. Because we all see the world very differently than the civilians. That's a pretty wide niche. And more important than that, I think, or as important, but let's call it um, uh, icing cherry sprinkles on top, is that we are already, we are ready for some different kind of entertainment, something that isn't being done. And my friend Billy and I were talking the other day Billy is um, my uh, my mm, social media showbiz guru, guide, advisor-ish. <laughs> um, he said, everybody's doing everything on the internet now. But there aren't a lot of people doing something you probably wanted to hear and then something funny tied up in nostalgia. So far as I can tell, that's different. That's one of a kind. And I said, well, of course it is, darling. <laughs> because I'm just doing what I've always done. The difference between <clears throat> me, Abby, and mom, or Friend Bear, or The Librarian, or Eleanor Twig, or Billy Dawn, or Shirley Valentine. The difference is they had set pieces to say because they were scripted creatures who lived inside the worlds they inhabited. I am pretty much free range. <laughs> oh my god, free range Vikings. You'll excuse me, will you? I just have to write that down. <laughs> Although that's kind of redundant, really, isn't it? Free <laughs> range Vikings. Long time ago, somebody said, where do you come up with your stuff? <laughs> I said, mostly I wake up. Sometimes I leave the house. <laughs> it just seems to materialize. So anyway, I want to tell you about this one book before I carry on with the, the, the important thing. Billy and I were talking, and, and I said, because uh, he, he, uh, he wants me to start thinking about the, the, the Story Me TV uh, stuff that I'm going to start doing as, as Abby, as an actress, as well as producing all this other stuff. And I said, does anybody read phone books? And he said, they don't make phone books anymore. <laughs> and I said, well, what if I read, what if I read the phone book as mom or, or friend bear or, I don't know, something? And he said, oh, that's funny. He said, you know, if you put on the yellow rubber glove and turn the pages, you, should, you could also, um, uh, <laughs> if you put on the yellow rubber glove and turn the pages, you could also place the, what are they called? ASMR people? What is it? Uh, ah, sound makes ripples. I don't know what that stands for. And I said, oh, I'll have to give it a try. And he said, do you actually have a phone book? And I, and, and I said, well, I, I, I think I have one from the 80s in the closet somewhere I, that I haven't thrown away. Perfect, the 80s, it's your, it's your decade. And, um, and so now I have, I have a phone book for this decade. Let's see. 
ask and ye shall be given. Phone books. All right, so the thing I wanted to talk about today was switching horses. And uh, and that came up when I posted the other day, I posted a picture about the price of gas and then I, I found this photograph of, of it's a close up of a horse with a woman riding it. Uh, all you can really see is her leg and her, and her foot uh, and what she's wearing on her foot in the stirrup. And it's like an eight inch stiletto sandal. <laughs> and I have a shoe thing, so I posted it. And immediately, um, I don't know, two or three of my friends who really, really ride horses, like they, they, they are horse people, <laughs> they commented and said, oh my God, what are you thinking? And I thought, I'm sort of kidding, I'm kidding. And then I realized, well, there's the theme. So I have ridden horses exactly twice in my life. And when I say ride or ridden, what I mean is I have sat upon the top of one twice. Uh, the first time I was a child and they had a pony thing at a local park and my dad <laughs> thought it would be a good idea. Or I thought it was, and daddy. And so they strapped me on this small horse. And so it would have been a pony, yeah, not a horse, um, miniature. And um, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm taller than the horse vastly taller than the horse and the horse sneezed and the saddle slipped and I fell off to the ground and I the, the horse turned and looked at me and I swear to you that horse was smiling <laughs> so I didn't want to ride the horse after that and the horse I can imagine walked away saying well my job's done where's the carrots um, the second time I did it on purpose uh, not really paying attention to um, uh, so the second time I did it I was on television before you can't do that it was a, a series called seen from here and uh, it was it was uh, produced on uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation the CBC network which is one of Canada's main networks and uh, it was like a pff, entertainment tonight. I interviewed famous people, and I got to dress up all glamorous and swan around and do things. And there were there were two other uh, regular weekly shows, um, each of them hosted by uh, men. And we were kind of in rotation. Um, uh, one of the guys was Tuesday, I think I was Wednesday, and and the other fellows was Thursday night at seven o'clock. So when you when you tuned in for the evening. Um, you know, talk show, magazine shows, you kind of scheduled your time for 7 p.m. and then you saw so. So I was having a production meeting with my, my producer one day, and, I, and, I, and of course I knew the other guys. I mean, we're, we're working in the same studio. How are you doing? But we didn't, we didn't hang out. Um, one of them was um, a political commentary, and he's very clever, and the other one was a country singer who took the, his production team on the road again, on the road, to country uh, towns, small rural towns, to interview people. And, and it, it, the host's name was Wayne Ross, dad. And he's this huge, wonderful guy, and a, a really excellent country singer. And he had a, a, a big following, still does. Um, and so he had the country flavor, and then I'm, you know, all Miss Glam. And I said, you know, it would be fun if we put together commercials or opportunities for me, for my show, uh, to be partnered with these other shows in some way, so that the audience that wonders, do they know each other, do they hang out, would, would get to know, yes, in fact, they do. And I, I thought it would be a really interesting way to cross-platform our marketing messages that, uh, you know, we're, we're not, we're not one-hit wonders and one-track ponies at CBC because there's this and there's this and there's this. And, uh, you know, you can have intelligent uh, discourse, you can have um, famous um, glammy things going on, and then you can have small-town um, showcases without having to switch the channel. So at some point, in the conversation with my production people, I said, you know, Wayne is going to the local fair soon. Um, he's going to the Metcalf Fair. You know, it'd be really cool. 
we should go. And my producer said, and what are you going to do at the Metcalf Fair? And I said, well, I, I, I can sit in the bleachers with Wayne and you can take a picture of us, for starters. And then the crew got silly. And um, I may have been an instigator. I don't know. I can't imagine uh, that I did all of the instigating. But I'm just trying to move the mouse over here so I can say, yeah, it was a good show, too. Um, we, I came up with the idea that Wayne and I should ride horses together, ride off together into the sunset. And, and by ride, I, I didn't mean barrel racing. I meant walk nostalgically probably led by somebody, I don't know, I hadn't thought that far ahead. And then I said, thinking about my height, and um, cause, and Wayne's height, Wayne's uh, six foot, six, five, seven, he's big. He's a big man, and he's a tall man, and he's got a big talent, and a big laugh, and a big smile. And I would be the opposite of that. Um, I am the I am the <laughs> the end table <laughs> version <laughs> of the Wayne doll. I I'm not big and rangy, and I um, I like the glam thing. And I said, so here would be cool. We put me on on like a, a Clydesdale, and we put Wayne on a Shetland pony. And then when we ride off into the sunset, our heads will be pretty much the same height. And they laughed and laughed and laughed. And at some point, somebody thought that was a good idea. Nobody asked me if I knew how to do that. Nobody. Uh, costume and makeup and, and whatnot, I, I was all dressed up like, a, like an English lady uh, who was going to ride side saddle with the, the hat and, the, and the, you know, the, the jacket and the earrings and the jersey hair. And then, and then I had the long skirt and the boots and the gloves. And I was just fabulous. And Wayne was Wayne, you know. He has a rawhide jacket. He's a he's a country he's a country boy. So we we, we go out to the fair, and um, we're we're sitting in the CBC van, and uh, talking about what we're going to do. And two horses arrive. At least one horse arrived. And uh, I said, Oh, <laughs> Wayne, there's your ride. <laughs> there's this horse that looked quite happy until Wayne got out of the car. <laughs> the horse. <laughs> <laughs> to all my loved ones, I hereby bequeath all my worldly possessions. <laughs> yes. And we were sitting there, I said, I wonder where my ride's coming. And at that moment, I, I, I thought for a second we were having an eclipse of the sun because um, it turns out it was my ride. This black creature called Midnight um, basically just blocked everything. And I looked up through the, the window and I thought, um... <sighs> because I knew we weren't going to change the idea. Uh -huh. And when I, when I got out of the vehicle, um, the props guys were busy um, sticking the uh, CBC logo decals uh, on the backs of the horses so that when we rode away, you would see these. And I looked around and I said, well, where are the stairs? How am I going to get on this horse? And there's no saddle, of course, because it's, it's a working horse. It's not a riding horse. And so there was no saddle. The idea was that I was just going to perch there for the five minutes it's going to take us to record this. And uh, so one of the crew said, oh, well, here, I'll give you a leg up. And so he put down his stuff and he held up his hands. You know, you, you hold up your hands and the person puts their foot. Yeah. So he held up his hands and I put my foot in and he, he went, alley -oop, and he threw me up and uh, over. And I landed down on the other side. Foomf. And everybody laughed really hard except me. Uh, I think the horse probably laughed as well. And uh, <laughs> it took four tries. Um, and on the fourth try, somebody said, maybe one of us should stand on the other side of the horse to catch her. Good thinking, good thinking. So we got me up there, and there I am. And <laughs> and we shoot it. And Wayne says what Wayne's supposed to say, and I say what I'm supposed to say. And then we have the wide shot of the two of us riding away. And we, we well, I don't know how many times we did it. I, I think really it didn't take that long because he's talented, and I didn't want to be on that horse that long. And uh, <laughs> when we were done, I said, how do I get down? And somebody said, I think you just, you know, lean. 
and I did. Mm -hmm. And when I stood up again, because crumple, there was a fellow standing there uh, holding the reins, bridle, something of the horse. And he said, uh, I want to shake your hand. You're a hell of a horsewoman. And, and I'm shaking this man's hand. And I said, well, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. I, I've never actually been uh, on a horse. And he just, he stared at me, smiling. And, and I said, why, why did you say I must be a hell of a horsewoman? He said, well, you, you don't know about our training, these horses? It's sled in a minute. And we don't yell go um, because go is we drop the pin into the into the lynch buckle and he he hears it and he goes and I said goes yeah because you got to put all you've got into it to pull that weighted sled as far as you can to win and I said and I'm looking around at all of the camera equipment and lighting equipment, all of which sound similar clinky noisemakers to me. And he saw me looking around and he said, yeah, that's why I'm saying you had to be a hell of a horsewoman. Because uh, any minute, midnight would have been on, on the way, <laughs> on the road, and we might catch up with you in Toronto. So... not uh, ventured to ride horses again um, because I, I feel uh, two is good and I don't want to go for that third strike you're out and I really don't believe it'll be a charm. I, I just have this crazy feeling and the irony is that a, a very very famous cousin of mine, a Hagyard, um, is a famous famous horse surgeon whose farm in Kentucky, is world renowned. Um, he invented the tilt table that uh, that they use to when when they need to operate on horses, and he traveled all over the world to teach people how to use the contraption so these very beautiful, expensive horses could be could be taken care of safely. So the irony is that we think of things as tradition only because we choose. There is no reason we can't break with tradition and create one for us. Now, people like us did things like that. People like us do things like this. Now, what do you think? Do you like it? I really like it. I really think that this is how all of us are going to get um, our feet back on the ground and feel okay moving forward. I think a lot of the protocols we followed for the last couple of years with COVID may be, may have, may bring certain elements to our new traditions. Um, if they work for us, if they feel right. And if they feel right, then who's to say they're not right? I do know for absolute certain that this way of us getting together twice a week and talking, or me talking and you commenting and rolling your eyes and saying, woman's out of her mind, is the way that we uh, are reimagining, reinventing, resetting, the old pen pal thing. We're only as far as we choose to be if we're using video. We're only as lonely and longing to hear someone's voice as the nearest phone. We can overcome today things that our grandparents never even dreamed of existing. 
because we are pivot masters. We are the embodiment of pivotry. So on that note, I have run a little long and I'm sorry. Um, on that note, I just want to quickly tell you that the interviews are amazing. You're just going to be blown away. I think it's exciting. And I think there's probably going to be a need for more books because you're going to see the ones that do get published fairly soon. It's not going to take me long. And um, you're, going to, you're going to say to yourself, I want to be in one of those books. Or I know somebody who needs to be in one of those books. And then, who knows? Exciting, isn't it? Yeah, I'm over the moon. Um, I, uh, I have something else to talk to you about on Thursday that is about pivoting. Garen, I rode a horse once. I wanted to show a girl I was such a good rider. So she who worked at a ranch would think I was all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> Garen, all that in a bag of chips. I may borrow that. So I do have something a little different to talk to you about on Thursday, and I hope you'll be able to join me. So before we go, um, we're still stuck at 68 uh, subscribers on the YouTube, and I have to get those numbers up. So um, because every time I have to try and explain to people who I am, like on Facebook or into Instagram or something, they go looking to see if anybody's ever heard of me. And when they go to they, when they go to YouTube and there's 68 people, they think she's delusional. So I need. To, We need to do this. Um, please, if you haven't already, like this video. Share it with your friends. And uh, Charles, I'm getting ready for my pivot very soon. Yes! And we need to talk about that. Um, like it. Share it with your friends. And um, be good to you. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I do have to extend this a bit. I want to explain something to you. There are times when I wake up and I feel exhausted. I feel like I've gone three rounds with a, a bear or something. And sometimes I wake up and I feel upset or tense. And I'm sure some of you go through that too, especially if you're trying to manage things during the day, something big. Here's the thing. While we're asleep, it's not our stage manager brain working, and it's not our actor brain working. It's our cave brain working. And not only does our cave brain not know the difference between past, present, and future, it has no understanding of awake and asleep. So whatever it is looking up, reflecting on, guarding against, it is rising to the occasion as though it's real. And we need to be good to us, not only all day, but especially first thing in the morning. When we wake up, if we're feeling at all worn down, we just need to say two things to our cave brain. Thank you. And... We're safe. Thank you. We're safe. And that gives your cave brain a chance to stand down. And probably is happy. It's a long night. Okay. Back to the closing routine. Be good to you. Morning, noon, and night. And don't forget to hug your loved ones. Because they love you and they deserve it. See you, Thor.